my guest today has played for, coached and managed basketball teams in the USA. Would you travel halfway around the world to live your passion? Hello Andrew and welcome to Engage. Hey man, thanks for having me. No, oh, absolutely my pleasure. Uh, it's always uh, good to have somebody a, a bit different uh, on Engage. Um, you're based out in the USA, you're a basketball coach, you run your own basketball coaching program at Andrew Heath Basketball. Uh, now I do have to admit that my basketball knowledge overall, being based in the UK, isn't as as good as perhaps it could be, but uh, I'm sure we're still going to have uh, plenty to talk about uh, on um, the, the call today anyway, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. So not only are you a basketball coach, but you've played, coached, and managed in the USA. You've also played and coached for a three-year period in China, which I'm sure is going to be uh, absolutely fascinating when we when we chat about that uh, a bit later on. And uh, I just want to make sure I get this right, so I'm going to read this out as well. And you're also the former head coach of San Francisco Power in the WUBA uh, as well. So uh, I'm I'm keen to to find out uh, how you know all of these different styles of coaching, uh, you know, how they're the same, how they're different. And uh, looking at your website, uh, when I was doing my research on you prior to uh, to doing the, the call today, you've done a lot. <laughs> and I'm not just done a lot. That. A lot of these things have, have overlapped as well. And, mm -hmm. and chatting with you uh, just now before we started recording, because uh, there is quite a time difference here. Uh, I'm based here in the UK, so it's approximately 4 p.m. here uh, where yeah. you are right now. It's approximately 8 a.m. And... It, You've already been up for, for hours. <laughs> yeah, no, you just start my day about, about 5 a.m. every day. <laughs> I mean, just, just before we get into everything then, I'm intrigued by that. What does a, a typical day for you look like overall in terms of, of the hours that, that you're, uh, you're awake and you, you're doing everything? Yeah. Um, I usually so I wake up around 5 a.m. every day, um, and then I go to the local gym, and uh, either conduct workouts or play some basketball. Um, I'm currently a head coach at a local high school in San Francisco. Um, funny enough, it's called the Drew School, so I, I get a lot of jokes around that, my name uh, being similar. Um, so I try to bring a few, a few of my players to that in the morning, either put them through workouts, work out with them in the weight room, or play some pickup with them. Um, do that for about two hours maybe two and a half, three, depending on the schedule that I have the rest of the day. Uh, go to the high school that I work at, where I'm the assistant a a athletic director, um, then kind of do my job with that all day, uh, whether it be scheduling, logistics stuff. Um, and then I'm also doing logistics stuff for Andrew Basketball throughout the day with that as well. Um, some other ball to book stuff, which we'll, which we'll probably touch on later. Um, and then School lets out around three o'clock, and then after school, I'll probably have a team practice with one of the school teams. Then I'll go to my another Andrew Heath basketball practice after school around five or six o'clock. Um, go home, uh, hang out with my beautiful fiance for an hour or two, um, and then just right back to it, doing some more logistical stuff, um, whether it be some website editing, uh, planning camps or clinics, um, and then I'm usually scheduling my weekends out during the week too, because that's when I do a lot of my uh, Andrew basketball and ball to book stuff. Um, so no, I stay, I stay, I stay pretty busy. So what about your free time then? What, what do you like to do in your free time? Do you have any free time? <laughs> um, sleep is probably my favorite thing to do when I'm not doing stuff. Um, sleep. Um, hanging out with my my fiance, as I mentioned. Uh, we live in Northern California in Oakland. Um, so there's a bunch of good wineries out here, good good hiking trails, a lot of outdoor activities. Um, so try to do that stuff. And then I, honestly, it's kind of a double-edged sword. I also enjoy playing sports, watching sports. So playing basketball is fun, but then I also might be playing with kids I train. So it's like a, a work session a little bit, or going to sporting events and stuff where I'll, I'll try to trick people. Like, oh yeah, well, we should go catch a Warriors game. 
And, you know, they're having a great time. Meanwhile, I'm over here, like, breaking down their offense and defense and other stuff. Um, but, you know, yeah, I try, I try to you, – you definitely need that balance at some point. So I try my best to make it happen. It doesn't sound like a bad life at all. Enjoying the Californian sun, enjoying the wineries, playing sports. It sounds, it sounds like you've got a pretty good setup there. It, it, it definitely has its good days, for sure. <laughs> so just before we get into this overall journey that you that's taken you around the world really playing and, and coaching basketball I'd just like to get a bit of a background about you as well because I know that you're not from California can you uh, let us know where you're from and uh, a little bit about um, where you grew up yeah um, I'm from the east coast of the United States uh, grew up in Connecticut which is one of the smaller states so for your listeners, if you, if you don't know where Connecticut is, a lot, a lot of people from America don't even know where Connecticut is. <laughs> um, but it's a small northeastern state. Um, yeah, no, was, was, was born and raised there. Uh, grew up playing a bunch of different sports, soccer, basketball. Uh, started, started, started doing track and field toward the end of my high school career. Um, very diverse community. Uh, saw all different shades and colors and economic backgrounds. So I feel like I was lucky enough to be exposed to a lot of stuff as a kid and growing up. Um, saw the haves and the have nots. Um, so I think that kind of shaped uh, my journey and exposed me to different things, which I feel like I'm fortunate enough to be comfortable in a, in a bunch of different rooms, no, no matter who's in there or what the environment is. Um, I went to a pretty competitive high school for basketball. Uh, we only lost 10 games during my time there. Um, was fortunate enough to go play basketball at Emmanuel College in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, was a two-sport athlete there. Played basketball, ran track. Um, and then afterwards was kind of figuring out like the journey, I feel like, which everyone does no matter where you live. You, you finish university or college. Um, and it's like, what's the next step, right? You were a, a two-track uh, or a two sport student rather you played basketball and you also did track and field as well how did you d decide which one you preferred or, or has it always been basketball has been your your big passion it's, it's always been basketball um for sure and then my, my dad always said too like even when I was doing other sports or running track he was like basketball was always your main thing like you might go to track practice but I was I would always end up in the gym shooting jumpers even if I was just messing around at, at, at the end of the day. Um, and I, I was, like, my, my time running um, college track, we were, we were pretty good. I, I, held, I held some records. Um, our team was ranked nationally. Um, so it, it wasn't like I was just running just, just to run. Um, but, yeah, no, and then it was also after I finished college, um, at least just from participating in the sport, I like physically I thought it was easier to obtain what I had done in basketball um, so I'm like 6'2 on a good day um, and during basketball season I probably weighed anywhere from like 185 188 to like somewhere in like the low 190s pounds um, not sure what that transfers uh, to your guys system um, but then for track I was like my lightest was like I dropped down to like 168 and then like my, my best weight was like 174, 175. Um, so just from that standpoint, I was like, I don't know if I want to keep this like body figure and, and diet and stuff I was doing. It just felt easier to keep the basketball physique over the track. Um, and then I also just thought like no one was really telling me I could run track professionally <laughs> either too. Uh, so that was probably a, another big thing. I had a few... Um, Local like track clubs want to like sponsor stuff, but no one was saying like, "Hey, you could go make some money doing this." So I think that was also the probably big factor that pushed me into basketball. So when you were playing basketball in both high school and uh, and also at college as well, did you ever have any ambitions of of turning pro, or did anybody ever tell you that perhaps you had the ability to take things on to the next level, or was it always more of either just a uh, a high school thing or a recreational thing for you? I definitely um, wanted to play college. I mean, I, I, I knew that like in middle school. I want to say like sixth, seventh grade, I was like, I definitely want to play college basketball. Um, so that was always a dream. 
Um, so like I said, the high school I went to, that we, we rarely lost, very competitive, um, and we sent guys to college every single year. So that was like my reason for choosing that high school. Um, playing professionally, it didn't really spark my mind until probably going into my senior year of college, because that's when I first started meeting um, some guys that were playing overseas in like different countries. Uh, so I met a guy that was playing in Turkey, and another guy that played in Mexico, another guy that played in Puerto Rico. Um, and I was like, you guys are definitely better than me, but this seems obtainable if I keep working at it. Where I, I'd met a few guys that had played in the NBA, and I was like, wow, this is, there, there are definitely levels to this. And I, just being realistic, I, I don't know if, I, if I'm ever going to reach this level. Um, but e even with that being said, go to college. And then same thing in college, I had teammates that went to go play in Spain, Puerto Rico, um, some other teammates that actually also played in China too. Um, so there was definitely, okay, I think I have the skill set and skill level. Um, but like I said too, it's just, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm just not producing the way I think a scout or a coach would want to. Um, so I started focusing on other things, but then my coach, um, Ted, Ted Cottrell, who actually recruited me to Emmanuel College, um, who played at uh, UMass Amherst under um, John Calipari when they had Marcus Canby there. Um, he was really in my ear. He was really, hey, I know the circumstances, but if you really try, like you're good enough to do it. Um, so it just stuck with me. And me and him actually worked together for a little bit after college. And he just kept being in my ear, kept being in my ear. Um, so when I got the opportunity to play in China, he was definitely one of the first phone calls I made. Like, thanks coach, like you always tell me I can do it. Um, I didn't necessarily always believe it, but you were always in my ear, so um, it definitely helps to have someone in your corner to kind of push you along the way, too. So would you say that was perhaps an early experience of having what makes a good coach, somebody who does believe in you, somebody who is uh, very encouraging, even if your overall ability doesn't match you know the, the work that you're putting in but somebody who is at least trying to keep spurring you on i think 100 percent um and i think I see, I see it a lot with the kids i'm coaching now too uh especially the ones that really have talent uh, you you definitely want to motivate and support every single kid you come across regardless of what the sport is regardless of if it's anything in life whether it's academics or a career um but then you, you do come across those kids or those individuals where it's like, hey, you could really do something with this. You know, you could really get into college or make a career. Um, and you pull those kids aside and you're like, hey, I, I support every kid in my program. I push every kid to try their best. But if we're being honest, I don't tell every kid you can play at the next level. I don't tell every kid you can do this. Um, so when, when, if I'm pulling you aside, it means something. And it is, it does take that kind of full circle moment to realize it. Because I was in that same boat. Coach, what are you talking about? Like, I'm good enough to play in college. I'm on the college team, but there, there's no way I'm playing professionally. Stick with it, stick with it, stick with it, stick with it. Um, so no, they, yeah, that was, that was definitely like my first insight to what coaching is. And it's not always X's and O's, right? This is a perfect example of... Coaching sometimes is motivation, pep talks, being someone just to listen to sometimes, right? Um, the X's and O's sometimes are just a very small part of the job. Yeah, so that, that's quite interesting, actually. So f from a basketball perspective, do you think that the, the kids who you're coaching, are they under a, a lot of pressure, say, from parents uh, to succeed because they know full well how much money is involved in the professional game and they're seeing uh, the kid as a as perhaps something of a, a, a pension for them for, for when they get older because I, I think we have that to some degree in in the UK where uh, football or soccer is the big money sport over here and you have kids at a very young age who are pushed into these uh, academies and from what I, I hear they're under intense pressure to succeed, and at the end of the day, th these kids are eight, nine, ten years old. No, I, I definitely think um, maybe not. Prof there are, I think, the kids that are getting pushed play, play professionally is such a small percentage, but there definitely is a lot of pressure. I think there is a lot of pressure for parents to get their kids um, co college scholarships. Um, 
regardless of the sport. It could be swimming, tennis, football, basketball. Um, it, it's, it's not cheap to go to college or, or university in the States. Um, so there definitely is pressure to, I need my kid to play AAU basketball, which is like club basketball. Um, I, I need my kid to make certain teams and they need to go to certain camps and showcases to play in front of certain coaches. Um, and yeah, no, you'll, you'll, you'll see, um, it is kind of unfortunate because it, it does turn into, does the child actually want this? If they do, that's great, right? Then the whole family's on the same page. But sometimes it's like, I don't know if your kid wants this as bad as you do, um, which, which is interesting. Uh, but then, yeah, I think once it gets to the professional ranks, there definitely is pressure. But then I think it's, it's um, there's pressure, but I think it's, it's a different level of pressure. Um, because if you're good enough to play in the NBA, now now we're just debating over like how much money you're going to make, rather than like if you're going to make money. Um, same thing for a few of my teammates in college. It's like okay, you're you're definitely going to play overseas. It's just more of like which country you're you're you're, you're going to go to. I think in the states it's more of can you get into college and not have mom and dad pay for that education. So do you think you come under a lot of pressure then from a, a parent who has a a younger child who's being coached by you and they're obviously thinking several year, years down the line that they, they need to get the kid into college and they, they're worried about the financial implications and then are, are they are you under pressure then as, as a coach to, to keep pushing that kid even if perhaps they're not that they've not got the ability to to get to the level which is required yeah no I think it definitely especially when it comes to those kids, because um, the parents will be like, which kid can make my kid better? Or which coach can make my kid better to get him to college? So if it's, if, if it's not you, we're gonna go to somebody else. Um, so I, I've experienced it. I've been on the other side where you might be coaching a kid for four or five years, and then they're just like, this isn't working, we're going. Or, or, if, or I've, I've been on the other side where I've seen a kid work with somebody for four or five years, and they're like, you know what, this isn't working, I'm gonna go to Andrew. Um, and, and it is, it is uh, once again, an, an, another double-edged sword, because um, if, if we're talking about myself or somebody else who's trying to like grow their business, good kids attract other kids, right? They wanna, the kids wanna practice and play with other talented kids. So if you lose a, lo a lot of talented kids, you might lose some of those lower tier kids who don't wanna come play anymore. Um, so I think there's double pressure, not only to keep that kid, but then, oh crap, if I lose this kid, I might lose 10 other clients. Um, so it's interesting. And then it's, that's why you, you do see a lot of guys just stick with like the um, younger level kids, you know, just like preschool, elementary, because they're not thinking about college yet, right? We're just out here having fun, running around. Um, when you get to that middle school, high school, college age, um, you see a lot more competitiveness, cutthroatness. You'll see a lot more coaches claim like, this is my kid. And I'm always like, none of these kids are our kids. These kids are their parents' children. We're just the coach, <laughs> Like, this is not my child. <laughs> I'm here to teach you basketball. Hopefully what I'm teaching you and who I am as a person attracts you to come back more often. But at the end of the day, if, if you wanna go somewhere else, I'm not gonna hold it against you, so. Yeah, that's that's quite uh, refreshing, I think, overall, and uh, I'm sure there are, uh, are many other coaches who wouldn't take such an attitude uh, to that. As you say, if, if the the competition is is fierce, and uh, as you mentioned there, there's um, there's so much money at stake at, at all levels uh, of the sport uh, that um, I think I think people would be reluctant uh, to give that up. You experienced coaching yourself uh, fairly early on as well. W were you starting uh, as a coach when you were still at college? Um, I started right after I graduated. Um, I mean, I guess technically I had done like summer camps um, in high school for like summer jobs and even like summer camps when I was in college, um, but wasn't really considered don't consider that coaching really, right? I feel like that's more just like people management, making sure the kids don't go crazy or anything. Um, but I finished, uh, 
finished undergrad, was trying to figure out what to do. Um, I was still working in athletics. I was uh, working part-time at Harvard University in their athletic department as a marketing assistant. Um, but I was like, ah, okay, this is nice, but I kind of want to be around the, like, be around the court and just the sports more hands-on. Um, so I was like, let me just start doing like individual sessions, right? Let me just start doing individual sessions. Um, so I just start training whoever I could. Uh, my first client was a sophomore high school girl who had just made her varsity team and she was trying to figure out if she can get more playing time. Um, and it, it, it just grew from there. And honestly, I was living in Boston. I was riding a bike around. I didn't have a car at the time. Riding a bike around with like a ball in my backpack just to different courts um, or, or different community centers and gyms. And just started doing that. And then um, that's when my same guy, Ted Cottrell, um, my college coach, assistant college coach, caught wind of that. Um, and he was like, hey, would you want to come coach with me at this company I'm working at uh, called Visionary Basketball Group, which is just outside of Boston. Um, and that was, I just kind of like dove headfirst into that. And, and that was really, I feel like now, I'm sure it's the same thing in, in the UK where there are so many individual coaches. It seems like every kid has an individual coach for whatever sport it is. Um, it really hadn't taken off yet uh, the way it is now. So we were kind of one, one of the first companies, I feel like, in the Boston area to do it. Um, and yeah, did that and started coaching all levels of players, which I kind of fell in love with. Was still coaching like the, the, the little kids. I had literally like a, a four and five year old class, but then I had an opportunity to coach WNBA players and guys trying out for the NBA draft and stuff like that. Um, and started to see like, wow, these high level players are respecting my knowledge and respecting my, my expertise on stuff and just seeing like, okay, cool. Coach Andrew said, make a move here. And then they do it and they come back, hey coach, like I tried it in the game and it worked. And I was like, oh crap, like this is working. <laughs> you know? Like I'm, I'm, I'm helping this, this, this player get better. Like I should kind of stick with it. Yeah, how does, how does that feel then when you're coaching somebody who's at that professional level, when you're not at that level yourself, but they're actively taking on board the advice that you're giving them? You know, what goes through your mind when, when that's actually happening? Initially, it, it is shock. Um, yeah, you're kind of taken aback. And then you start realizing um, there is that old saying, like, if, 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 if a player can't do it, they'll become a coach. Um, and I feel like there, there is some truth into that. Um, so while I, I don't think I'm a scrub and I do think I, I can play a little bit, I'm definitely not playing at the highest level possible. Um, but I do think I, I do see the game well. I do have a good, a good knowledge. Um, I, I understand body movements, basic body movements. Um, so there is also a wow factor, but then there is like um, a credibility part where they will check you. Like, hey, I am playing in the WNBA. I am preparing for the NBA. I need to know that you know your stuff. If you know your stuff, I don't care where you played or I don't care if you never played in the NBA, WNBA, but you have to know your stuff. And then there is a portion too. If, if we are doing individual sessions, I do need to be able to demonstrate it to a certain degree. So I can't be a complete like scrub. I need to be able to do a basic move or, or, or a basic jump shot. Maybe I can't shoot as well as you or I can't dribble as well as you or jump as high, run as fast, but I can just show you the basic movements to like get into that that flower move. I am intrigued as how you ended up going over to China. Uh, can you give us some more info on how that move came about? Yeah. Um, so kind of, I've, I've always been this way, just doing a million things. Um, but as I mentioned, I was, I was fortunate enough to, to work at Harvard in their athletic department, um, had opportunities to train professional players at the same time. I was helping run exposure camps for, for, for professional players to go overseas, um, doing all these things, writing uh, blogs. I was coaching high school basketball. Um, and while I was staying busy, I wasn't really necessarily like seeing like a, a lot of financial gain, right? I feel like I had a lot of cool things on my resume, 
made, made a lot of great connections, but it's like, at the end of the day, you want to be compensated somehow, some way. Um, finished my master's degree, and then I actually had two job interviews. I had one with the New York Liberty uh, WNBA team to be on their coaching staff, and then I had one to um, work in the Players Association for, for the NBA. Um, take both interviews, both interviews don't go through. Um, and then at the time, the New York Liberty, I always like sit on this, like, oh, it'd be interesting if I did the other thing. The New York Liberty, like, we just don't have the money to pay you. But if you want to volunteer, sure, we'll take you, bring, bring, bring you on staff, we'll give you all the free gear, anything you want, but we can't give you a paycheck for this. Um, but my mindset at the time, like I just said, it was like, I want to get paid. I'm looking for a job. Um, so I was like, I don't want to go back to hustling and bustling and doing all this stuff. What am I missing from my resume that's getting me? I'm, I'm getting the interviews. I'm making it to the final round, right? I'm literally, I, I know who they're hiring because it, it's coming down to me and that other person. So what do I else do I need to do to get over that hump? Um, so at least from my viewpoint at the time, especially with all the basketball stuff I had been doing, I was like, I've actually have never been overseas for basketball. I'm helping everyone get contracts and helping everyone go play, but I myself have never actually gone. Um, so I was like, I should look into that. Um, so like I said, I just started applying and then my initial plan was I'm just gonna go for a year. Where, where, wherever I go, I'm going for a year, I'm gonna come back to the States and reapply to similar jobs and kind of work, work my way up. I graduated in May. I applied for the job in China in June, and then I left in September. Got off the plane, and I was kind of like, what the hell did I get myself into? <laughs> no, no idea what was going to go on, um, but ended up staying three years, and it was, I think it was one of the best decisions of my life. Brilliant. How old were you when you went to China? I was 25. And did you go over by yourself? Yep, com completely by myself. Completely by yourself, 25 years old. Had you been outside of the US previously, or was that your first time out? I had, 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 had left the US um, for like family vacations and stuff like that, uh, but it was mostly on this side of the world, right? I've been to South America, I've been to Canada, Mexico, um, the Caribbean, uh, and I always tell people this, like, it's different traveling places than like living there. Um, and so I go to China, once I get past that like two week time period, I'm like, okay, this is not vacation, right? <laughs> this, is a, this is, I'm not here for a 10 day vacation. I, I'm living here. Um, so no, yeah, it was, it was completely different. And then de definitely, um, I think you find out a lot of things about yourself when you put yourself in those positions, right? I'm in a place, I know nobody, I have, I have to rely on myself. You see how strong-willed you are. You see kind of what your morals and ethics are. You kind of see like what you think is right and wrong. You see how you conduct yourself in a room. Um, so I think it really puts yourself to a test too um, than in any other environment really. So did you find it difficult when you were out there then? Bearing in mind you were all by yourself, you obviously didn't speak Chinese. Uh, what were your experiences like then, uh, at, at least initially? Um, at first, the language barrier obviously is the first thing. Um, and then I think the, it, the, 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 the cultural differences are so vast too. I think if, um, I've, ac I've actually been trying to come to, to London a, a bunch um, over the past years. I got some buddies over there doing some basketball stuff. Um, never been, but it seems like there's enough cultural la layover and connection that it wouldn't be too hard of a jump for me to like just come tomorrow and maybe make some friends or go to, go to go to a pub and get a drink or something. Um, now it wasn't the case when I landed in Beijing. I can't read anything, don't know where to go. Especially there too, the thing that took me back is just the size of stuff and the population, um, which I've told people about, but it's hard to like grasp until you've actually been. So Beijing is about 25 million people, um, which which is huge, right? So. Here in the States, I think Los Angeles is about 5 million, and that's like one of our bigger cities, which we consider like one, one of our major cities. 
five million in China is like a third tier, no one thinks about place. Um, so I, I get off the plane, get in a taxi. It's just skyscrapers for miles. There's people everywhere. Um, so it's a little hard at first, but I had a mindset of just say yes to everything. Every, every opportunity that comes up, say yes to it, try new foods, hang out with new people, experience new stuff, go to different cultural events. For a lot of basketball guys, they don't do that. Whether they're coaching or playing, they just go to their country that they're playing in and they just go, go to the gym, go to the court, and then go back to the hotel or apartment and just do that for the whole season. Maybe occasionally we'll go out to a club or a nice restaurant, but I'm not going to the local whatever. I'm not trying to hang out with the local people. I'm just doing my, my thing. There are, there are some players and coaches who do adapt, but I feel like the majority of them just, I'm here for ball and that's it. Yeah, that's a real uh, business-like uh, approach. <laughs> yeah. There, uh, it doesn't sound like uh, a lot of fun. You started coaching in uh, China, and I, again, looking at your your website, you were coaching for various different companies, and there seemed to be quite a lot of overlap uh, there. Were you doing the same type of coaching for the the different companies, or did you have different responsibilities with each one? It was different responsibilities for each one. Um, so I initially went with this company called Show One Basketball Academy. Um, and it was basically, we ran basketball classes and clinics and camps. Um, so we weren't like doing teams or like individual coaching. Um, and so I, I did that when I initially got there. Um, but quickly, as with everything else I've been doing, just made a bunch of connections and started networking. Um, and kind of found the basketball scene out there um, and was able to start working with who ended up being my teammate, this guy who had his own company. Um, his name's Natural. It was called Supernatural Sports. I also started working for him. And as I mentioned earlier, started working for the NBA um, at, at, at their academies and schools. Um, so the NBA job was similar to, to the, my initial job in China, just camps, clinics, um, we started doing team stuff towards the end, um, but it was mainly camps and clinics. Um, working with Natural, that was kind of more what I was doing in the States. Um, so we, we were coaching a, a local high school in China. Um, we were doing individual training. We were doing camps and clinics. Um, we were doing physical fitness workouts. Um, so I, I really enjoyed my time with him, and that's still one of my good friends I talk to to this day. Um, so shout out Natural if you ever see this man. Um, but yeah, no, it was my, I had, had a blast working with him and learned a bunch working with him. Um, and obviously the NBA was just a huge network and still a family that I'm a part of and still uh, people I, I, talk, I talk to as well. So when, when you're out there coaching high school age kids in China, just to go back to the expectation side of things, is there a, a higher expectation for, the, for them to succeed compared to what you experienced in the USA or, or was it same or how, how do they compare? Yes, yes and no. Um, similar to what you had mentioned before, they use the academy system out there as well too. Um, so very different from the States where I feel like kids here, the main goal, as it was for myself, is to play college sports, right? Um, so all of our grassroots systems, everything, I feel like is more competitive because everyone's playing that to get a scholarship, um, which isn't the case in China. There are there are university players, um, and there are there are some good u university players and college guys out there. But if you're one of the top level guys, they kind of find you right away and put you in an academy, um, where that's pretty much what you do. You're playing back like you, you take classes and you get your education, but the rest of your time. You're training, lifting, and preparing for a basketball career with the national team or professionally somewhere else. Um, those kids are under a lot of pressure, for sure. Um, and I, I had a chance to work with a few of those kids. Um, actually, one of the kids, ironically, that I worked with when I moved back to the States, he actually also went to go play basketball at the University of California. Um, so I was able to bump into him a few times because that, that university is close to where I live. Um, but same thing, his schedule was basketball all the time, school occasionally. Um, the other kids, 
they are under pressure, but I feel it is just to perform overall as, as a human being. Um, so a lot of kids I saw through show one or Supernatural or at the MBA schools, um, after we saw them, they would go to a French class. After their French class, they would go to piano class. After piano class, they would go take maybe a martial arts class. After martial arts class, they would take an algebra. They were, you know, it's just like all these things lined up to, to prepare you for a life after bas like after your youth, we're gonna prepare you to be a phenomenal adult, a great worker, um, a good businessman or woman. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a different pressure. And then funny enough, there was pressure, I guess, to perform, but not necessarily take basketball to the next level. So we're not looking for our kid to necessarily be the next Yao Ming or Jeremy Lin, but we want our kid to be the best in this class. So that was a conversation I had a lot. We understand our kid's not gonna play on TV one day or play in university, but we want our kid to perform the best in this class. Um, which is interesting, because we get in a lot of conversations around like, it's, I feel like it's different if you're taking the academic class. You'll see, if you take 10 French classes, we can guarantee you at the end of the 10 classes, you'll be able to say your name, thank you, and all these different things. So parents would be like, if my kid takes 20 basketball classes, will they be the next Steph Curry? And it's like, it doesn't quite work that way in sports. <laughs> it's a little bit different. <laughs> yeah, that sounds fascinating. Do you think then that it's similar in, in the US if the, the parents are, are pushing the kids to succeed perhaps because they, they, they didn't have the opportunity when they were young or or they weren't good enough or whatever. Do you think that's the same in China then where the, the parents are trying to kind of live through their kids' achievements? You know, they, they want them to be the, the best in class, perhaps then so they can show off to their friends and say, oh yeah, my, my son is the best basketball player in, in class, even though they, they know that there's not going to be a, a long-term future in the game for them. Yeah, and I feel like that's... Um, I feel like Every parent has, has that pride kind of everywhere in the world of like, I want, I want my kid to outperform the other kids. Um, and then especially if, 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 if I was a good football player or tennis player, my kid's in a tennis class, I want my kid to either be as good as me or outperform me. Um, but I think a lot of times I would see parents that like had, had no athletic background. You know, they never touched a basketball there, but they were still like, hey, like, I want my kid to be the best. Um, so it's just interesting because they, they, def they definitely want the best for their child, but it's like, oh, the way you develop in sports and athletics isn't quite the same way you develop in a classroom. There are, there are similarities, but it's just a different process. Yeah, I, th I think with sports as well, some kids are just naturally good at it. <laughs> They've just got that natural ability that, that it almost seems like they're, they're born with, and you, know, you, you can coach coach it a bit to them but I think with some it's they've either got it or or they haven't but for yourself as well you also played some basketball out in China you played for um, a team called the the Beijing Panthers um, what sort of level um, was that then compared to what you've been used to in the US yeah no it was something I I stumbled upon um, right so initially I go there just, just to coach, um, I kind of had my hoop dreams, right? Played in college, went to, went to a tryout, no, nothing came from it. Um, and so I'm over there, I'm playing just pick up with some other foreigners and guys. And then one of the guys was like, hey man, like you're, you're pretty good, like you should play in some leagues. Um, so I'd, I'd been there maybe two months at this point. And I was like, all right, man, just like tell me tomorrow. It's late. Just tell, just tell me tomorrow. He's like, no, you, 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 you can like make money and get paid doing this. And I, I still, I'm just like, he must mean like everyone puts in 20 bucks and then the winning team collects the money and maybe something like that, which, I, okay, I, I've done that stuff in the States. Like, just tell me tomorrow. He's like, no, 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 no. Like, they'll pay you to play. I was like, okay, cool. Like, maybe we should stop and you should tell me some more. Um, so he shows me these videos of, of, yeah, just guys playing in these, in like legit games and tournaments. People are like shooting commercials and doing TV ads and all this other stuff. And I was just like, wow, it's just a, a whole world I had no idea about. Um, Cause they have their CBA, right? Which is like, 
their top league, and that's where a lot of like the NBA guys go, right? That's where like J.R. Smith and Michael Beasley played and Jimmer Fredette. Um, and then under that, they have all these like wild ball and like, I, I, would guess, I guess I would say like minor leagues um, where guys are making like decent money playing. Um, guys are making a living. Like you'll have people that are playing in the Euro League come over in their off season and play in China and just make money doing that. Um, so I would say it's it's definitely not the highest level of overseas basketball, but I, I had an opportunity to to play against Jeremy Lin. I had an opportunity to be coached by an, an NBA coach for most of my time over there. Um, was playing against a bunch of overseas guys that had played in numerous other countries. Um, had played with and against got retired NBA players who were just just traveling the world, making money just until they decided to figure out what the next what the, the, the next stop was for them. Um, so no, it was it definitely opened so many other doors, um, and it was kind of like a, a dream come true for me too. So the first tournament I play in, and and we're, we're getting the full experience, right? We have team buses, we have team planes. They're paying for our flights, they're paying for our hotels. Um, we get it, we get on a plane, we fly to the city Guilin, uh, playing a, a weekend tournament there. Getting and same thing, we're getting paid whether we win or lose. And then there's a cent, an incentives. If if you win, you get more. If you're the MVP of the tournament, you get more. Um, we're shooting commercials. We're shooting posters. So it was something I literally stumbled upon, but had an amazing time. I have most of my jerseys framed from the experience back home. I still have a bunch of my posters and other stuff back at the house too. Um, I found out it was. An, an amazing experience, um, and, it, and the person who actually got me playing was the man I mentioned before, Natural. Um, he was kind of the player manager uh, for the team. Um, so he saw, after that initial pickup I played, I went to go play in a pro-am league out there, um, played against him. He was like, hey, we're looking for another guard. Would you want to play? went to like the team tryout and then played with them for about two and a half years. Yeah, that sounds like another world. <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> I had absolutely no no idea about that. I I knew that China had their own like top level basketball um, competition, but I had no idea there was this other uh, complete industry uh, underneath that as well. And especially not one which uh, you, you could make a living from. But as you said there, you were there for about two and a half years. You then returned to the USA. And uh, after you'd been back for a while, you became the manager of the San Francisco Power, the uh, WUBA -W team. Uh, how did you get that opportunity? So funny, it, it is funny enough, once you do go overseas for a extended period of time, uh, I feel like the basketball community gets very small. Um, so I, I may have never been to a certain country, but I might know somebody who went to that country that knows the other person. Um, so I actually had a buddy, um, one of my teammates from China actually played in the UK for a little bit. Um, and he had sent me this flyer for this woman's professional league that was starting up in California, the WBA, um, um, by this woman named Fatima. Uh, who he had knew, known from his playing careers in, China, uh, in, in, in the UK. Um, so I hit her up. Hey, I think we have a mutual friend, uh, Tim. I saw you're starting this, this Wuba League up in California. Can I help out in any way? And initially, I saw they were doing tryouts and combines and showcases. I was like, hey, I have experience doing that. Can I, and can I, can I just come volunteer my time, be one of the coaches at the combine, whatever you need? She replies back, oh, definitely, we're actually also looking for managers and coaches for teams. Um, so I was like, you know what? I've never, I've, I've trained professional players one-on-one. -on -one. I myself have played professionally now, but I've never coached a group of professional players. Let me take on this challenge. Um, and so that, that's what the, the WUBA is. They actually changed their, now, their name now. I believe they're the WBA. PBA, the Women's Professional Basketball Association, uh, which is 
the formerly uh, WBA. Um, but yeah, it was it was con the, the league was consisted of current overseas players who were trying to stay in shape and play during their off season. Um, and the aim for this league is to basically become the G League to the WNBA, which the WNBA doesn't currently have. Um, so we, we had we had some girls, we had some women in the league who were former WNBA players. We had a bunch of high level overseas players, a bunch of uh, women that just graduated college that were looking for the first contract. Um, and then we had a bunch of just talented, retired college hoopers, you know, like 27 to mid 30 year old women who were like, I played in college. I, I might've played like high level division one college, but now I'm, I'm an accountant, but I just, I just want to get back into playing basketball. Um, so yeah, no, I, I did that all um, last year. Amazing experience. Um, it was a little bumpy because COVID was still kind of rampant and a active at the time. So we had some games canceled and like other stuff happened around that. But we were able to play a whole season. Our team made the playoffs. Um, unfortunately, got knocked out first round of the playoffs. Um, but no, it was, it was an amazing experience and same thing. Made so many connections and definitely want to support the league as much as I possibly can. And then what made you decide to set up your own coaching then, uh, the, the Andrew Heath uh, basketball? Um, why set up your own coaching when you could perhaps just as easily work for somebody else and, and, and coach that way? Yeah, um, that actually started when I first moved back from China. Um, similar, I think a, a, lot, a lot of my story is from things I didn't get or my failures, I've, I've figured out ways to start something else or, or kind of bounce back. Um, so I'm, I finished playing in China. My coach over there, his name is Rodney Hurd, um, long time NBA executive, coach for a little bit. Um, I tell him I'm moving back and he's like, hey, let's see if we can get you like a coaching job. Um, so I had an interview with the, the University of Memphis and Texas El Paso. Um, University of Memphis had just hired Penny um, Hardaway and he was bringing in all these like former NBA coaches. So I was like, there's no way I'm making this. I just knew kind of after he got the job, I'm not, I'm not gonna get this job. Um, the, uni the, the UTEP job, um, they went with somebody else. So I was kind of in the same position I was before I went to China. I was like, I don't want to, do something, I don't know, mediocre, something else. Let me start my own thing and just see how it goes. Um, so I started Andrew Heath Basketball. Um, when I first moved back here, I had access to a boys and girls club, like a local community center out here in California. And I pretty much just like lived at that community center. Um, I would spend like 12, 13 hour days in there just coaching. And same thing, I was coaching anybody that wanted a basketball lesson. So if you were a four-year-old kid, if you were a high school player, um, if, if you were a 45-year-old businessman that wanted to get in shape for a men's league, I didn't say no to anybody. I took everybody on. Um, and then I just started get, picking up traction and I started um, training some college guys, started training some professional players. I, I helped a guy, um, he's a walk-on in college I helped him get a contract and play in the Vietnamese Basketball Association. Um, so it just started blooming and blossoming from there. And then I was, from my overseas connections, was able to do some camps in different countries and it just kind of just like took off from there. So you've been doing that now for almost four years since you returned um, back from China. What would you say the biggest achievement is that you've had since you started your own uh, coaching school? I think um, it would definitely be the the international camps I've done. Um, from like a personal standpoint, I think overall the the, the, the heartfelt moments are, are helping kids achieve their goals. And it's it's everyone focuses on like, oh, I hope this kid get into this college or university. It's awesome when I see like that fifth grade kid who got cut from his team make his sixth grade team the next year, or the kid that can't make a left hand layup finish that left hand layup. Um, I think those are like the the small like daily achievements or like goals I like seeing. Um, 
But personally, also, I think the, I've been able to go to Australia and do camps. I've been able to go to Mexico and do camps. Um, I was able to do one in China. Um, it wasn't officially Andrew Heath basketball, but it was still at Andrew Heath camp, which I still kind of consider like, which kind of started all, all this stuff. Um, and then unfortunately with COVID, I've, I've been scheduled to kind of come to Europe and do some things, but it's kind of been put on the back burner. Um, so I've been, try, been trying to go to Italy for like a year and a half now. Um, as I mentioned, I have, I have a former teammate that, that lives in London. Um, been trying to go to London for about a, a year and a half now. Um, so I'm hoping once things kind of settle down and um, I can kind of, I don't know, open the schedule up a little bit, be able to add some more countries to, to that destination and stops um, and, and throw that up on the website too so people can see uh, some, more, some, some more countries that I've, I've been able to go to. Okay, great. And can you tell me a bit about the Ball to Books initiative that you've set up and, and how that fits in to everything else that you're doing with your coaching? Yeah, uh, so that actually started, as I mentioned, so I had a chance to go to Australia. Um, I was out there um, running camps and clinics and working with a bunch of their talented um, youth out there. So a lot of guys that are looking to, to come to the States to play at, at the college level. I was out there coaching with a gentleman named Brian Curl, who's a former um, national team coach. He's in, he's, he's in the Hall of Fame out there. Uh, so very fortunate enough to meet him. Um, but I was also training some of their professional players out there, um, both men and women. So I ended up training uh, this woman named uh, Jacqueline Luna, Luna Castro. Um, so she's a professional player. She's currently playing in Mexico. At the time, she was playing in Australia. She's the captain for the Mexican women's national team. Um, and we were all out, her, myself, and a few other professional players. And we were talking about like life after basketball. Like what do you guys want to do um, once you finish playing? Um, which I feel like for me has always been a thought because playing professionally hasn't always been a guarantee, right? So it's always been like, oh, I might have to go get a regular ass job because no one's gonna pay me to shoot jump shots all the time. Um, so we're having the conversation, a few, and a few of the players were just like, I, I don't know yet, I'm just gonna play for as long as I can, and I'll play like I'm 40. And I was like, well, good luck with that, man. I, I, don't, I don't know how long I'm gonna be playing for. Um, but Jackie's like, oh no, I've always wanted to do like some nonprofit stuff and like give back to the community and some other things like that. Um, so Ball to Books just started as this like social media challenge that we wanted to do. Um, I was gonna go back to California, I forgot her next stop at the time, um, but it's like, let's just do a social media challenge and see how that goes. So initially was, I'm gonna donate to an organization of school of my choice, and then I'm gonna challenge five people to do the same. And then she was gonna do that, challenge five people. Um, and, then so, and then with all of our international connections, we'd figure we can like, kind of do like a global impact and see how it goes. Um, in which we, we kind of did. So at the end, it was just a month long challenge. I think we had donated to over 50 schools in six different countries. Um, so like, wow, this is great, cool. We'll do another challenge in a year from now. Awesome. At the end of the month, people kept hitting us up. Hey, when's the next thing? When's, when's the next ball to books thing and all this stuff? Um, so we're like, oh, I guess we have something here. Let's just keep it going. Um, so then we did a free basketball clinic in San Francisco. Same thing for kids that usually can't afford basketball clinics. Then we did a free basketball clinic in Mexico. Same thing for kids that usually can't afford free basketball clinics. We started doing um, educational resources through social media, promoting um, Black History Month, Hispanic Heritage Month, um, Asian American Pacific Islander Month. Um, when, when COVID was rampant, we would donate to different organizations to help with that. We would tell people where to go get tested. Um, and then we, then we did another challenge. And so we've been doing that for, I think, two and a half years now, or almost three years. Um, and we, we, we kind of have our staples of, we're gonna do at least a few free clinics every year. We're gonna do a donation drive every year. We're gonna keep doing these educational um, resources online. And now we've, we've just started um, 
we're going to call it Bottle Book Spotlight, which is basically going to be kind of podcast style interviews, talking to people who played sports at a very high level and now have transitioned into another phase of life. Um, so kind of going from ball to books. Um, so we're doing that and we're, we're still um, kind of figuring out where the end goal is or what the next step is, but we, we just kind of feel like we got something good going. So let's just keep riding this wave out and see where it takes us. Yeah, it sounds amazing and um, sounds like um, a lot of people are, are getting benefit from that. So you know, long may that continue. So as a coach, what would you say is the best piece of advice that you've ever given somebody? Be believe in yourself and then consistency is key. Um, if, if you have one good workout on one day, that, 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 that doesn't mean anything. Um, but it has to be consistent. You've got to keep doing it every single day. Um, and then um, other than that, yeah, just you have to believe in yourself. You have to be your own cheerleader. And I think I, I kind of learned that in China. Um, if I have a bad game, no one's there to pick me up or cheer me up. Uh, if, I'm, if I make a bad play, no one's in my corner. Um, you got to be your biggest cheerleader. Stay, stay consistent. And then um, hard work never fails. There's really, there's, there's really no secret. LeBron James, Steph Curry, Messi, whoever, like they're, they're doing the same drills you're doing just every single day at a much higher rate. So do your fundamentals, just do them every single day, put in the hard work and then it'll pay off. That's some good advice indeed. Now, if anybody wants to find out more about you, if they want to find out more about your coaching, if they want to find out more about Balls to Books, where is the best place or places for them to do that? Yeah. Uh, the website for Andrew Heath Basketball is just andrewheathbasketball.com. Um, same thing for social media. Instagram is at Andrew Heath Basketball. Uh, same thing for Twitter. Um, ball to Books is ball, the number two, books.com. And then same thing for Instagram and Twitter at ball, the number two, books. And for Twitter at ball, the number, the number two, books. Okay, brilliant. That sounds like a lot of numbers to remember. So I'll get all of the, the details from you af after we finish. And uh, I'll put all those links in the description so people get easy access uh, to them and they don't have to try to remember everything. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I think this is a good place to end here. Thank you so much for joining me on the call today, Andrew. It's, it's been a, a fascinating insight into what it's like to be a basketball coach in the US and um, also that you've had those experiences overseas, uh, including your, your three years in China, which uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people would be envious of because it's it's not something that you see uh, every day so uh, i'm sure you'll uh, you'll treasure those uh, memories and uh, experiences forever but again thank you for joining me uh, on the call today and uh, i look forward to keeping um, keeping up with what you're doing on social media and uh, to see what uh, happens next with uh, with everything that you're doing oh, yeah well thank you for having me on i enjoyed the conversation as well um and yeah thank you if you enjoy Engage, please show your support at EngagersClub.com, our exclusive members-only club with enough content, training, and behind-the-scenes access to keep you going until the next episode. That's EngagersClub.com. Also, please rate and review this podcast wherever you download them. Stay engaged.